this first poem that I'm going to start off my poetry collection with is called A Concerto of Spice that was mentioned in the intro. Um, I think it's very integral to my poetry journey because this is kind of what started it all. Um, I presented this at the Senate chambers at the Capitol in California and um, it won Poetry of Cells, which I'm so blessed for and really um, started my career. So here it goes. A Concerto of Spice. The subtle hint of spice, a symphony in the air, a crescendo of turmeric against mustard, sharp notes, the melodious harmony of cardamom and cinnamon wafting a waltz. The passion and tang of citrus as fluid as a ballad's flute, ginger as strong as a strum of a bass, the crisp presence of mint like the presence of my mother, the conductor of the ensemble. She taught me that the perfect hint of lemongrass orchestrates the soothing simplicity of balance. The heat of paprika strong as the heat of traction. Tart zest of lemon as sharp as the power of speech. The crackle of dry peppers as loud as the laughter of my childhood. The smell mingles about now. I hear it. Her presence dissolving in the wind. Her frail hands stirring the pot and her voice commanding, soothing, echoing in the shadows of my mind, her voice calling me into a simpler life. I smell it. And in the silence, the silence, she dissolves into the air around me. So I hope you guys enjoyed that poem. Um, just a little background, I feel like um, I'm kind of sick of saying it every time uh, because if you guys have been to my other poetry events, um, I say this poem quite often, but I feel like it's just so integral to the beginning of my poetry journey and the sense of who I am and what my heritage is. So I just thought it would be um, nice to start off my poetry collection in that way. So my next uh, poem is called 2003. And just as a backstory, it's not some random number. Um, 2003 is actually the year I was born. Um, and these earlier poems uh, that were in my poetry journey really reflect um, the sense of who I was before. It's not to say that those poems are immature or they have lost meaning, but just that they're not who I am anymore. And they just show how much I've grown as a per person, but they do symbolize a lot of um, where my roots are from and how my life has changed because of who I was before. Um, but of course, this uh, poem still holds a lot of meaning and uh, represents how my poetry really started. And um, in the poem, it says 16 years. And just as a hint, if anybody does the math, I'm not 16 anymore. This is just when I was 16 that I wrote this poem. So that's why it has that number. But here it goes. 2003. My body, a compilation of old CDs, tapes, and cassettes. Useless, aging, worthless, rotting in the back of some old shelf. To see my potential, you find that old dusty CD player, something you haven't looked at for ages. And you can't seem to make it work, you see. You can't find my potential because you don't know how to find it anymore. You think I am worthless, you're right. But I am not defined by my net, net worth. I am art, a living, walking compilation of 16 years worth of memories, struggles, stories, and to unlock my potential, you just have to know where to look. You finally press the right button. It was the one that says play. As the video starts, you silently watch what memory that CD held and you remember why you never threw it away. So I hope you enjoy that poem. Um, my next poem is an ode to my queen, um, Miss Beyonce. And I mean, if anyone knows um, her songs or are aware, um, this poem kind of integrates one of the lyrics from her really popular song. I'm not gonna give that away just yet, but um, I really wanted to include this poem because um, 
part of being an Asian American kid, um, first generation growing up in a hub like New York, New York City and Jackson Heights, um, I was really influenced by pop culture and I really wanted to assimilate into my American society. So that led me to take on a lot of um, this, this representation of people of color. And though it was very, at that time, there were not a lot of people of color that represented people like me, um, just seeing someone who had a similar background or who kind of looked like me on screen was really empowering. So here it goes. It's called, Who Runs the World? Girls, when I was five years old, I wanted to be a spy. Gadgets, foreign espionage. I was on the impression that my parkour skills emulated Jackie Chan. When I was six years old, I wanted to be the president. Correction, prime minister. Laws and rights, wistfully staring at the screen as the United States inaugurated its first African-American president. When I was seven years old, I wanted to be a Nobel Prize winning scientist. Inventions and discoveries, learning the concept of Newton's gravity after falling off a swing set. When did that change? When did hitting one goal become enough because you are anything but satisfactory? When did our future become anything less than to run the world? So thank you. Um, that's really powerful poem. I really love that poem. Um, it talks a lot about who I am and who I've become. So my next poem is called Scent. And um, it kind of reflects my innocence, my vulnerability, um, in the sense that even though I'm turning 18 this January um, and becoming an adult, I know, like all that responsibility, um, I still love to savor the small moments of innocence and childhood that I still have before, you know, it all goes away. Um, and this poem kind of reflects that. And this poem also talks about my obsession <laughs> for candles. Um, if I could, I would live in a candle store. I mean, I just love candles. And it's not just, um, you know, that pumpkin spice kind of brings us back to fall or apple pie, you know, during that winter season. But um, I feel like a scent, especially in my culture, because incense is such a big thing in Asian cultures. I mean, we're just so used to having that incense all around the house or candles. Um, it really, these scents really bring me back to the specific memory or the specific person that I, is just ingrained in my brain. So like one scent will bring me back to my kindergarten classroom. So I just feel like scent holds so much power. So that's what my poem is about. So scent. A person has a fragrance, a scent tailored to their body a distinct aroma unbeknownst to them but reminiscent to them of them to all those who bask in their ex existence in their beams and sun rays it's when you take in the dense fumes of incense or candle smoke and all you can grasp is a whiff of memories and people a candle's wick fluttering in the dark a sprig of baby's breath swaying in the wind i imagine i smell of lemon drops and dandelions, of my innocence that is unbeknownst to me, for what I smell are the bitter notes of vulnerability. So thank you. Um, my next poem is called Hands, um, especially in the situation. I mean, in public speaking, I feel like we're always doing something with our hands. Our hands are kind of a refuge. So, you know, you're playing with your hands if you're nervous, um, and they're kind of like our um, barrier or our link to the tangible things around us because touch is such a big um, important sense in our life. So hands. My nails pierce white flesh, the blood cut off, the only color concentrated in gashes and cuts irritating my skin. My fists clench so tight as if I hide something on my palms. Yet my hands are as barren as ghost towns. Cities once filled with life and wonder and now a plain desolate scene. Wrinkled and tired, but they can't see my hands. They can't see my pain. They can't see the cuts, the bruises, the scars. I gently tuck my hands beneath the table. So when they ask me, how are you? I can answer just fine. So thank you, that's the end of my poem. Um, my next poem is called um, Lala. 
And actually, I call my grandmother Lala. And um, just as a background story, um, Lala isn't actually a typical um, term for grandmother in my culture. It's called Nani. But I don't know why my cousin just said Lala and then one day it stuck. And now we're all calling my grandmother Lala. Um, but this poem really reflects a lot of my muse and my um, poetry because I a lot of what I write is about the women um, and womanhood in my family and what that means because being a girl um, with a South Asian background there's a lot of um, taboos and subtle things that you don't realize until you grow up and you're like wow this is really affecting my life but one thing that stays true is the maternal figures in my life and how they have shaped who I am um, and who I will become so here it is Lala 1983 I wonder what her first smell was, first taste, first sound, first sight. The rusted green copper of the ethereal lady gripping her glowing torch. My grandmother saw an image of sacrifices, dreams, and burning futures in that woman. She watched her life slip by in the honey hue of the statue's fire. But I, the American-born Desi, see my life in her. The woman who cradled me when my forehead felt hot to the touch. The one who pulled every toy from the top cabinet upon my command. The woman who years to hear my laughter echo in her house again. The woman who asked me, Berta, ya chaye? She carries my life, my tears, my country. These women raised America fed the country innovation and change. Their faces don't have to be painted in red, white, and blue for us to know that they are our past, our present, and our future. When, we, when her footsteps sank into this country's soil, she cast her light cotton dupatta off, a city woven in every thread, a worn tapestry of Karachi. She didn't know that the sights the smells, the sounds and tastes had seeped into her tender skin. That the everything and that the nothing she brought with her would build the foundations of my life, its glass towers and its concrete jungles. In my mind, America isn't a country. It's each color and the palette that paints her complexion. The pink of gulab, the golden sticky dew of jalebi, and the shade of a warm milky cup of chai. It's her face staring back at me. Thank you. Um, this next poem that I'm going to read really shows this um, transformation in my poetry and myself. Um, I feel like this is a time in my life where I had a lot of pent up um, anger and frustration. And whenever I had um, a test that went wrong or an essay that went wrong or my grade wasn't working out in school or something happened, I would come back and I would tell my mom, oh my God, I'm gonna just use this, like, I'm just gonna exchange this anger for like um, some type of, um, I don't know, tangible reward. And I would just sit down at my computer and just write everything being really frustrated. But I feel like what happens to my poetry is that when I go to write something, um, it completely changed something. It completely changed the direction and become something new and something different that I just um, love. So this poem was kind of a result of that pent up frustration. Um, and it's called Barcode. Congratulations, it's the girl. At that point, I would advise you that you put a barcode on my birth certificate. You brought me into this world as a beacon. You came to this country for hope, you set me up for success, but I'm sorry. The world was against you. It set me up for failure. My advice, you should have put yourselves first, for those are the rules of the fittest. One priority to crave gold and cut through soul. Success could have been yours, but instead you got me a closed door. I'm nothing but a price to them. So let them have it. When girl meets world, it's a barcode that permeates through her skin. I'm inked with my surface value, left for the consumer, advertised to the world who bends me into a number. I'm inspected, face value 10, body value 50, mind value zero. My lips aren't plump with fillers. My, mo my body is modified or reduced. My mind is worth millions. A foolish girl, did you know they don't care about your mind? All of them are just searching for your barcode. 
Um, I hope you like that poem. It's really uh, sticks with me because especially being a woman, I feel like we're always being judged. We're always um, kind of up for sale, uh, whether that be in media or in society. So my next poem, um, really big change in my poetry. I mean, this poem is based on the pandemic. And I mean, who has the pandemic not changed? It has been such a historical and monumental event um, that's kind of changed our lives um, in another direction. So this poem is called The World in Chaos. And actually, just a little bit of background, um, a lot of structure mimics Dr. Seuss <laughs> because I mean, who has not read Dr. Seuss? I mean, my first book that I read was Green Eggs and Ham. And um, growing up, I mean, being a child, you're like, those are the those are the books that you can actually read the rhyming pattern of Dr. Seuss. But as you grow up and I looked into um, Dr. Seuss, he actually wrote a lot about um, societal problems and society in his um child books, but we just didn't realize it. And he had a lot of social commentary about those issues. So I use kind of that same structure um, that I kind of grew up with to um, reflect the pandemic. So the world and chaos. Paradoxes, paradoxes everywhere, where division disguised as inclusion. Tons Touch once love, warm sensitivity, not cold and rot with disease. Stay away, stay away from me, we yell to our friends and family. We smile behind masks, doing simple tasks, school, work on the street, but only our eyes meet. Our smiles rot from the disease, a disease of chaos. Because when do we start calling abnormalities the new normal? So that's, it's pretty short, it's a short poem, but I feel like it, for me, it packs a punch. Um, my next poem is called Colonize, and um, I, it was said that I have South Asian background, so I come from, um, my parents come from Pakistan and India, and if you don't know, um, both of these countries were colonized by the British um, and gained independence in the early 1950s, um, right at the end of World War II, really, and um, it's been a long time since we've gained independence and a lot of um, people of color come from countries that were previously colonized. Um, but I was talking to, um, and just a shout out to Miss uh, Laura Mendoza. She's from the California Indian Museum and Cultural Center um, here in Sonoma County. And we were talking about um, Native Americans and how in a sense they're still being colonized. And I thought that was a really interesting factor to note because even though we have gained independence and colonization um, isn't as it's not apparent anymore in a sense it is because a lot of people say um, the world has changed it's been a long time since these things were happening thus these other things like systemic racism um, colonization stuff like that isn't happening anymore but I feel like that's exactly the point. The world has changed and so has systemic racism and how we view people of color. So of course, it's not gonna be as apparent, it's more subtle now, um, but that doesn't mean it's still happening. So this poem is kind of on that basis and it's called Colonize. Colonized my country, my mother and father, colonized my land and home. Took no stole the beauty of my land, stole pepper or spices, never offering your hand. Stripped our trees of bark, leaves, berries, and broke. We broke under your chains, shackles and bolts. Beaten, lynched, and sold in our land. That wasn't enough, so you took, giving us a dirty look. Colored me brown, 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 like the mud underneath our feet. The mud is underneath our skin, colonizer because roots and flowers grow within us. Gummel, neem, handy leaves, gulab, nergis, gende, kapul grew within us from pools of tears. Ones you can never take. Color me brown, colonizer. Brown like the sons you have killed. Killed beneath your boots. Brown like their mothers and fathers killed by hearing the news. Brown like their friends and followers killed in the wake of being colored by you. Color me colonizer, but color the blood beneath your boots too. So thank you. Um, I feel like that's a very important poem for me, especially, um, and coming to terms with my heritage and my identity. Um, this other poem is called Brown, and this is based off of um, everything's happened with the BLM protests right now um, and with the tragedy of George Floyd and countless others who've died from police brutality. Um, so it's called Brown. 
you know I never thought I was brown. I looked at my skin, its pigment, its scars, its imperfections, skin that was, sh skin that was shot, bombed, held in chokeholds and down beneath your knees, skin that cried mama, skin that called to breathe, skin that was once hot that now feels cold, skin colored by division, a hopeful vision, movements and marches of precision. I identified as brown when you killed a brown man and called him your slurs. I identified as brown when you mocked me on the bus for my name. I identified as brown because you killed my brothers and sisters. You kill us too, because to you, we are all the same. So that is a very powerful poem to me once again. Um, and I'm gonna finish off this um, poetry collection um, with a poem called Performative Feelings. And I feel like this applies to all of us, especially with the protests um, going on in the movement that a lot of people are performing performative action, which is sometimes um, just doing things for the sake of it being a trend or other people doing it. And I feel like even though um, we are all under that pressure sometimes because of social media and society, it's time for us to recognize that we sometimes we are doing performative action and that is not okay. And that the real reason that we should help people is because for the sake of humanity. So um, if my English teacher was here, I feel like you guys have all heard this. He would um, say that in the conclusion of a argumentative essay, it's you have to have a call of action. So this last poem is kind of my call of action to all of you to really um, you know, invoke change and like actually act on your words and not just speak them. So performative feelings. Feeling, the expression beyond actions. Feelings, dwell on the fundamental experience of being human. When something beyond us becomes one with something as believable as our own body, our material existence, a feeling can stimulate being more human than not. Feeling can mean our very sense of empathy and compassion. Feeling is touch, it's smell, taste, sight, hearing. It's our connection to the dark matter of the universe. Something is felt when a mother first caresses her child for the first time after nine months. When a, when a soldier re first returns home to be met with a warm embrace. Something is felt when people unjustly beat and lynch innocents who dare to use their voice. When millions are slaughtered, enslaved, trafficked, and abused day by day. Life continues its stride on a blade and no one says a word but the feeling remains. It shouldn't take a movement to mouth your words. It shouldn't take a post on social media to write your words. It shouldn't take your television screen telling you to speak your words. Feeling is expression beyond words. Feeling is what makes us human, but feeling still is not enough to save humanity because those who went and touched dark matter, sat with their ancestors spilling their blood, those who paced in man-made cataclysms, those who still sense, feel, and speak is why humanity still lives. Thank you. That's the end of my poetry um, collection. So thank you all for listening to my poems. I'm so honored to be here once again. Um, and just a final thank you for being here and bearing with me. <laughs>